as uh, stated before, there are several factors used to determine the spontaneity of a reaction. Overall, Gibbs free energy allows us to take the entropy of a reaction and the enthalpy of a reaction and the temperature at the, um, which the reaction takes place. And looking at all these factors, we're able to determine the, um, the spontaneity of the reaction. Now, Gibbs free energy is the change in free energy that occurs if the reactants in their standard states are converted to the products in their standard states. Um, now we can't measure delta G directly, so this calculation, this delta G that's going to allow us to determine an overall spontaneity, we actually have to kind of mathematically calculate it. The more negative the value for the delta G, the farther to the right the reaction goes in order to achieve equilibrium. So basically the bottom line is the more negative the delta G, the more spontaneous the reaction is. Now, there are three methods by which we can calculate free energy. The first, the first method is using the gibbs helmholtz equation that you see here on the screen. That is delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. Note that, notice that in this equation, both the entropy and the enthalpy are considered. And what we're looking for here is an overall negative sign and if we get an overall negative sign here, then the reaction is spontaneous. So this is the first way that we can calculate Gibbs free energy. The second method for calculating Gibbs free energy is using Hess's law. And as you can see here on the screen, we're taking two reactions, the combustion of diamond and the combustion of graphite, and we're rearranging those equations so that it gives us the equation diamond going straight to graphite and we can calculate the overall delta G and the delta G is negative three kilojoules which means it's you know slightly slightly towards the spontaneous side of things so therefore a diamond going to graphite would be a spontaneous process because the delta G is a negative value so the first method was using the gibbs helmholtz equation the second method for determining the free energy of a reaction is using Hess's law. And then finally, the third method um, looks very similar to using the heat of formation to get the overall delta H. We can take the sum of the delta G of the products minus the sum of the delta G of the reactants, and again using the moles from the balanced equation, and we can get an overall delta G. So you could actually go to a table of delta G values, look them up for your various products, look them up for your various reactants, and then um, sum them up, subtract products minus reactants, and you would get the overall uh, delta G. Now note here the delta GF of an element is uh, zero at its standard state, and that was the same, you know, the, all, the same was true of uh, delta H for an element. It was also a um, it was also equal to zero. Now, delta H, delta S, delta G, and spontaneity. We said the gibbs helmholtz equation allows us to determine when a reaction is spontaneous and when it's not. And of course, H is the enthalpy and uh, T is the Kelvin temperature. Now, what this table in front of us here does is it summarizes you know, all of the possibilities. So if it's an exothermic reaction there in the first line and the delta H is negative, and the value of uh, delta S is positive, then we do get an overall delta G that's negative, and so therefore the reaction is spontaneous. Now, if the delta H is positive, that is, it's an endothermic reaction, and the value of the delta S is negative, which means it's going, going to be less entropic, then we get a positive value of delta G and the reaction itself is not spontaneous. So those are the two extreme situations. Um, the first situation being totally spontaneous because of both delta S and delta H. The second situation being totally not spontaneous because of the value of delta H and the value of delta S. Now the last two situations are one in which one of the variables favor spontaneity and the other one does not necessarily favor spontaneity. So the value of the delta G really determine, is determined by the magnitude of the two values. So notice that if it's an exothermic reaction there in the third line down, but it's going to less entropic conditions, then it really de is determined by the uh, magnitude of the temperature there. 
and that reaction would be spontaneous if it's more exothermic than it is less anthropic. So if the delta H value is large enough, then the fact that it's negative will overcome the value of the T delta S, because if delta S is negative, then they're, um, in that equation, of course, that whole term is positive. So if the delta H is negative enough, then the reaction will be spontaneous. Notice there in the last line that if delta H is positive, that is, it's an endothermic reaction, then the entropy just has to be large enough. The delta S has to be large enough that that whole T delta S term then becomes large enough and it's negative and it can overcome the positiveness of the delta H. So again, it's spontaneous if the absolute value of T delta S is greater than the absolute value of delta H, and this happens generally at high temperatures. So if it's exothermic but less entropic, or if it's endothermic and um, going towards greater entropy, those last two situations, then those situations are really temperature uh, dependent. Now, free energy depends on the pressure of the system, so we generally state that this particular reaction is occurring at a particular pressure. Now the reason for that is not the enthalpy of the Gibbs free energy equation, because remember enthalpy is not pressure dependent. But entropy, because it's dependent upon position, does depend on the volume. So if you decrease the volume of a particular sample, then you have less positions, so this, the particular system is less entropic. So because entropy does depend on temperature then, the delta G is affected by um, pressure as well. So if you look at the uh, Gibbs free energy equation there, it is possible to take the standard delta G, which is the delta G with the degree symbol, and then you can take the, uh, the Q, and remember the Q is the products over reactants, but not necessarily at equilibrium. And using the Q and using the standard uh, Gibbs free energy, you can actually calculate what we would call non-standard Gibbs free energy. Of course, there's two constants in there, the R from the ideal gas law, and then the temperature at which this particular reaction is occurring. Now, delta G tells us the spontaneity um, of a particular reaction. Now, if that delta G happens to be zero, then uh, the Q, of course, would then be equal to the equilibrium constant, so we're actually at equilibrium. So the equation you see here at the bottom is determining the standard delta G based upon the equilibrium constant. So we can actually, in the laboratory, come up with an equilibrium constant and then use that along with the temperature to determine the standard uh, delta G. So again, delta G is not measured directly. Rather, you know, variables are measured and then those variables are used to calculate the delta G. So this equation allows you to uh, go from the delta G, standard delta G, to the uh, equilibrium constant. Now, if the standard delta G is equal to zero, by the equation on the previous slide, then the K would be equal to 1, which is kind of an unusual situation. If the delta G zero was, uh, delta G naught was less than 0, then the K would be greater than 1, which means the reaction is going to go um, in the forward direction. So those two things go together. If the delta G is negative and the K is really large, then the reaction is going to go in the forward direction. Now the third situation there is if the delta G is uh, greater than zero, so that means it's positive, then the K is going to be small, and that particular reaction would favor going to the reactant side, so it would be shifting to the left.